Hello, first, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah? Well, right, the first thing I'd say, I'm Irish, so my default mode is to kind of talk at 100 miles per hour. So if you kind of hear me going back into default mode, just kind of just do kind of collective, you know, calm down. You have a lot of information to get into the next half hour, but... Um, okay, where to start? Um, the first thing I normally say to crowds is, um, well, you're a quite clued on crowd, so there's no need for me to say to not listen to the media or not listen to people like David Cameron um, to get your, you know, your thoughts from. Uh, but the one important thing I would say is actually don't listen to me. Um, I'm not here to tell you what is the right way of doing things or the wrong way of doing things. Um, all I'm doing is kind of living out my own personal truth. And I will try to speak as much of that truth as I can, but I'm also a propagandist for my own agenda, even as much as I don't want to be. I still have elements in me that is trying to force a certain agenda. So I'm not here to say what's right or what's wrong, whether spending five quid for your lunch tomorrow is an act of Satan. You know, I'm not at all <laughs> suggesting that you're all very, very naughty people and you should you know, rel you know, relinquish cash tomorrow. I'm just saying, I'm just saying think. That's all I can really say is just think about the issues and the deepest cause of the issues, not just looking at them on their superficial level. You know, we, we're kind of caught up in this thing of um, climate change and carbon emissions and stuff as if it's a kind of all a mathematical equation these days. You know, how can we get our CO2 levels down to, you know, whatever, like a ton or something? Um, which is completely missing the point. You know, the, the way we live today is the result of a cultural story. And that's what I kind of want to bring today, is kind of highlight a cultural story. The, the cultural story itself is no more ridiculous than Santa Claus's. If you think of the story of Santa Claus's... Oh. <laughs> is, there any, is, there any, is there any children in the crowd? <laughs> is, that a, is that a no? Can I continue? <laughs> Does anybody here believe in Santa Claus? <laughs> Yeah, we've got Santa Claus and money are both real. They're both, they're both, they both exist in reality. So keep on, keep on believing. <laughs> um, with Santa Claus, we obviously think Santa Claus is, you know, when we were kids, Santa Claus is real. You know, and at two, at, at year, two years of age, um, at two years of age, you, 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 Santa Claus just gives to you. But you'll find when you get to four or five. He only gives you if you've been naughty or you've been nice. There's an element of conditionality that comes into Santa Claus. And I believe that this kind of cultural story of Santa Claus is kind of, in a way, it's gearing us up for life in the economic world that we've created today, in this model of living. Um, because the, the way we do things today is just packed full of conditionality. Um, unconditional, conditional giving isn't giving. Uh, Conditional love is in love. We need to get back to unconditionality because um, I'll, I'll go into this later on. I've kind of gone off on a sidetrack, but I, I wanted to kind of highlight the fact that money is a cultural story, and it's it, it's been given power because we because of experience because we use this thing every day. We know that we know that we can get food, we can get accommodation, we can get crap because we've got this kind of thing in our pocket. But it is just a cultural story. And culture stories, I, I'm not against stories, I think stories are an amazing part of life. And we need stories, but we need stories that are applicable to our time. And, the, and some of our stories have been created thousands of years ago. And I don't, I don't believe that these stories are working for us anymore. I think we need to create new cultural stories to work for, for the challenges that we're faced with today. And so part of what I tried to do through communication of what I'm doing is to is to kind of work with everybody and, and help us all kind of co-create co new stories, new stories that actually work for us as the people, stories that make life here on Earth worth worth living. Like we're all talking about saving the planet, but very few of us actually talk about making an existence here that's actually worth living in. You know, because the way things are going, I, I sometimes I don't even know if I want to be here anymore. You know, it, it looks so dire sometimes. So if we're going to save the planet, let's save it in a way that actually is fun. You know, that actually we can wake up on a Monday morning and look forward to life, as opposed to waking up on Monday morning and thinking, what the hell 
you know, why am I living like this? Which is what more and more people are feeling these days from the feedback I get. Anyway, I've got a side track about cultural stories, which is my main passion. It's not about money at all. Um, maybe to go into my background, I'm a business, economics and marketing graduate. Um, and so I call it moneyless living because it's good marketing. I'll be honest. It's like it gets people ears perked up. But actually what I'm talking about really is about changing cultural stories, about localising our lives, you know, about creating ways of living that are actually um, they're actually worth living. And which and I'll I'll go into the reasons, uh, as I say in a minute, why I believe this invasive weed we call money um is the problem. Well, it's not the problem. I'll, anyway, I'll continue with the, my main thread. I went from being a business graduate type person um, to luckily just sort of chance got a job in the organic food industry um, and met lots of wonderful people um, who brought in lots of new perspectives into my life that I would have never had before if I'd gone into some other industry, um, which made me really, really think about the way I was living and life and ecology um, and so I spent three years kind of managing a couple of organic food companies and just um, I thought organic food is amazing and it is amazing but it's definitely not the holy grail of, of sustainable living you know this word we call sustainable and like our understanding of sustainability in mainstream um, conversation and debate is just it's horrific you know we're nowhere near sustainable. Like, even if you all grew organic food tomorrow, it would not be sustainable. Our entire lives are based on destruction and exploitation. And we think that making one or two small changes is going to make us completely sustainable. So I was looking in 2006 at the world and all the major issues in the world, um, you know, from deforestation to the massacring of the oceans to you know, wars in Iraq um, over resources so that we can have, I don't know, dildos and um, hmm. other kind of crap that, you know, all very useful in some ways, but, but uh, <laughs> it's, probably not, it's probably not worth the lives of you know, a million Iraqis. Um, I was looking at all these things and thinking, which one of these things am I going to spend my time, my little precious time on earth here, helping in some kind of small way? And I had this realization that actually all these things, you know, the, the pollution off of rivers and the sweatshops and all these you know, terrible social things, they're all symptoms. They, they all, and they all have, they're all a symptom of a cultural story. And they all have a root cause. Um, the surprising thing is that there's this kind of misquoted biblical thing that, you know, money is the root of all evil. And you're probably expecting me to say that because... I'm living around money, but actually it's, it's nothing to do with money, I would say. And I don't actually believe in evil, by the way, either. It's like, apart from McDonald's, McDonald's <laughs> is evil. The rest of the world is kind of okay. Um, there, there is no such, I, I don't believe there's such a thing as good, good or evil. You know, some of you might, some of you might not, but that's, it's, it's a very kind of subjective thing. We all have our own opinions about, you know, um, what is good and evil. Like one person's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. That's the kind of... A, you know, the kind of perfect example of um, the argument around good and evil. Um, yeah, so for me, it's not that money is the root of all these problems. It's, it's our deluded sense of self, for me, is the problem. Like, at some point in our evolution, we began thinking that the skin encapsulated ego, this thing that you see that you think is, whose name is Mark, that kind of moves and talks, um, we start, I, I started thinking that I'm Mark and that everything else is other. Um, and actually all that I am physically is a bunch of elements, you know, 60 different elements or so. Um, and those elements are soil fertility, there are rivers, there are the trees that produce the oxygen that goes into my lungs. Like if I was to ask you guys today, do you think that your leg is part of you? Does anybody here not believe their leg to be part of them? No? Right, what about the bacteria in your gut, right, which is something of itself, right, but it's also, you'd also say, well, it's a very important part of me, makes up me, it's, it's, it, the lines start to become a bit more blurry, you know, it's what about the oxygen in your lungs right now, is that part of you? And you can see how it gets quite difficult to actually ascertain what really is you, 
And so when you get this perspective that you are the rivers, you know, you are the trees, you are the soil fertility, it changes your entire relationship with the whole planet. Um, and this is a very, very crucial point to understand. Like until we actually reconnect with the whole, with everything, then very, very little is going to change. Until we actually fully understand that we are these things, we're not going to stop. There's this kind of debate between, you know, selfish, the selfish gene and selfishness and non-selfishness and altruism. It's um, a guy called Charles Eisenstein once said that selfishness is good, but with an expanded sense of self. So if you see yourself as being everything, if you see yourself being the rivers, being the oceans, being the trees, being everything, then why would you abuse yourself? Why would you pollute yourself in that way? If you, if you can, in the very depth of your being, understand that you are everything, then it completely changes how you, how you act in the world. Like to, you know, to extract the oil, to pump it into the air and destroy the oceans would just be the most insane thing to do. It's just polluting yourself because you're breathing that stuff in, you're drinking it. Like we shit and piss in a water supply. You know, that sums it up. That sums up how insane we've, we've become through cultural stories. Um, so you're probably thinking, okay, that's self. Where does self come into this? Because I'm here, you're, you came here for a talk about living re 